Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you, yes you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. Today is part 14 of the AI series where we're still talking about baking nav meshes procedurally at runtime, because last video covered some use cases but not all and especially not the more complex ones. Let's talk about games like Diablo or Path of Exile. These have really large procedurally generated levels that Limiting the scope to three or four tiles is infeasible because you need to also consider things like the enemy AI that will follow you whenever they're within some range. So for those kinds of scenarios, what we did last week doesn't really work very well. So this week, what we're going to do is implement something new where as the player moves throughout the world, we will bake the nav mesh within some bounds around the player that will allow enemies to follow me because they'll be within that range and whenever they're out of range, then they can stop following. We're not going to get into the enemies in this video. That's going to be next week, next tutorial Tuesday. The enemies are coming in. This week, what we're going to do is just the baking of nav mesh as the player moves throughout the world using these bounds. This allows us to have relatively large levels. The size of levels doesn't matter because we always have the fixed size of nav mesh that we're baking around the player. I had no idea how to do this whenever I started doing this video, but it was really cool and really exciting to do, so I'm excited to share this knowledge with you. Let's check it out. And before we go any further, I just want to give a huge shout out to everyone who's supporting me on Patreon right now. I really appreciate it. Every bit helps the channel grow, reach more people, add value to more people, and that means that more people are making their game development dream become a reality. If you want to help me in that cause, you can show your support on Patreon, patreon.com slash Academy. You can get your name up on the screen, you can get a voice shout out, and some other cool perks. We have another new scene called Bake Nav Mesh in Bounds. This has the exact same player and camera that we used in the last two scenes, so you can copy paste them if you want to follow along into a new scene. I've also made a new prefab called World Floor Section that has, again, a 10 by 10 floor and some obstacles on it that are 2 by 1 by 1 and 3 by 1 by 1. This is actually the exact same floor prefab I was using in the last video with just the two side walls removed because I want the player to be able to move in any direction on the X and Z plane. If I look around, you can see this is a really large level. There's over 2000 floor sections here. And there's one specific one right next to the player at the beginning where I've expanded the floor a little bit so that way we can make sure that the nav mesh modifier of not walkable is working correctly whenever we're procedurally baking this nav mesh. And for this video, we're gonna make only one new script called the area floor baker. If we open the area floor baker, we're going to add some private serialized fields up at the top. We'll put a private nav mesh surface surface that'll define the surface that we're going to use to bake with. Really what it does is allows us to configure the settings in the same way that we are accustomed to setting them with the nav mesh surface. We're actually not using the nav mesh surface bake functionality. We also want a reference to the player. We'll also add a private float update rate and set that to 0.1 by default. This will be how frequently we will check the player movement distance to see if we should read bake the nav mesh. The next one will do a private float movement threshold. This will be how far the player should move before we rebake. I'll also put a private vector 3 nav mesh size, set it to new vector 3 20 by 20 by 20. The X and Z are the only really important pieces here. The Y should be at least one, but higher than that since this is a planar level doesn't really matter. If you do end up making a level with multiple levels or floors on the Y axis, then the Y value becomes more relevant. In. We'll also do a private vector 3 world anchor. That's going to be the last position that we baked on. A private nav mesh data, which is the nav mesh data. And I'll make a private list of nav mesh build source called sources. The nav mesh build source is used as input to the nav mesh builder that we're going to use in a second. And this is just a list of things to consider whenever we're baking our nav mesh. We won't directly modify this, but we do need it here. And the last thing we'll do is at the very top, we'll say using nav mesh builder equals unity mesh builder. This allows us to easily use the nav mesh builder by the nav mesh builder name. We'll define the start function and in there we'll assign navmesh data to be a new navmesh data. Then we'll do navmesh.addNavmeshData 
the nav mesh data that we just created. This allows us to update the nav mesh data and the nav mesh understands what this data is. We'll then say build nav mesh and pass false there. What that's going to do is actually build the nav mesh and saying false means that we want it to happen immediately instead of it being asynchronously. Then we'll start our code routine to check the player movement and in there we'll just check if the player has moved more than our movement threshold and if so then we'll build the nav mesh with build nav mesh true and we'll set the world anchor to be the player transform position. You could potentially do this on update but doing vector 3 distance every single frame is kind of a waste because most of the time you're not going to move that far in a single frame and it being an update rate of 0.1 10 times a second is plenty since our nav mesh size is much larger than what the player can actually get to in a particular frame. We'll then go down a little bit more and make a private void build nav mesh and again that takes a boolean of async. If it's async is true then we will asynchronously update the nav mesh data. If it's false then we'll do it immediately. So I'll define some bounds that are the nav mesh bounds and set that to be new bounds where the center is the player transform position and the size is the nav mesh size we defined at the top. Then I need a list of nav mesh build markup called markups, set that to be a new list of nav mesh build markups, and I'll also define a list of nav mesh modifiers. Modifiers and markups are really more or less the same thing here. The nav mesh modifier is like the component that we use and the nav mesh build markup is the data structure that the nav mesh actually uses when it's doing the baking. So we'll check if the surface.collect objects is children, then we will just check all of the components in the children of the surface for the nav mesh modifier and we'll collect all of those into this list. Otherwise, we use modifiers equals nav mesh modifier dot active modifiers, and that gives us a list of all the currently active modifiers. Then we're going to loop through all of the modifiers. So we'll do for int i equals zero, i less than modifiers count i plus plus. What we'll do here is a little bit of checking to check the layers. So we'll do surface dot layer mask ampersand one bit shift modifiers index by i dot game object dot layer if that equals to one. Basically, what this is saying is if the surface layer mask includes the game object layer that the particular modifier is currently on, then that will be true. We'll also check if the modifiers indexed by i affects the agent type that the surface is set up for, so the surface.agent id. If both of those are true, then we will say that this is a valid markup that we should consider for baking the nav mesh. So we'll do markups.add a new nav mesh build markup. And I'll do this object constructor again with root equals modifiers indexed by i that transform, the override area being the modifiers indexed by i dot override area, the area being the modifiers dot area, and ignore from build modifiers indexed by i dot ignore from build. So this is what I saying that the nav mesh build markup is the data structure that the nav mesh understands and it corresponds to the nav mesh modifier that we use in the inspector. That'll be the last part of the loop. We're just going to add up all these markups that are applicable to whatever we're trying to bake right now. We'll then again check if the surface collect objects is children. If it is, then we'll say nav mesh builder dot collect sources. What this does is populates our sources list. Pass in the surface dot transform, the surface dot layer mask, surface dot use geometry, and surface dot default area. Pass in the markups and then the list of sources that this function will populate with all the sources that it found. Surface.transform is the root object that it's going to check everything under, and then the rest of them are just pretty self-explanatory, I think. When the surface.collect object is anything other than children, we'll do navmeshbuilder.collect sources, and we're going to pass all the exact same variables except the first one, which is the navmesh bounds. This tells the navmesh builder the volume to check which objects intersect with, and then populate those into the sources list. Once we have a list of the navmesh sources, what we're going to do is remove all the nav mesh agents from there because we don't want them to be blocking movement because they should not block movement. If, you, if we don't do this step, then wherever the player is, there'll be a cutout around them based on their collider. And that makes them have some jerky movement because they're currently standing where there's no nav mesh. And so they'll teleport a little bit whenever we rebake the nav mesh. So we need to make sure we remove them from the list of sources. One really important thing to note here is that if you're using the collect objects children and your nav mesh agent is not a child of the surface, then you can actually remove this line. And you'll actually get a performance benefit here because if you have a very large large scene like what we have here, there's a lot of sources, there's hundreds and maybe even thousands of sources in here that we have to traverse and check the component and then see if it has a nav mesh agent on it. You might see a potentially substantial performance increase by removing this line, but you need to make sure that your nav mesh agents will never be a child of that surface. In the other case where we're using the nav mesh bounds, you most likely have a lot fewer sources and your nav mesh agents will be in there and you do need to keep this line. 
You'll most likely also have to change the layers that the surface considers whenever it's doing the baking, because if you're using what we have set up right now in the scene, it'll pull all of the render meshes from our Unity Chan model, and this will not remove them correctly. And if async is true, we will call navmeshbuilder.update navmesh data async, pass in the navmesh data that we want it to populate. We'll get the surface.get build settings for the build settings, pass in the list of sources, and I'll pass in a new bounds based on the player transform and the navmesh size. This will asynchronously update the navmesh data. The navmesh system itself has already registered this navmesh data, so whenever we update it, the navmesh will update automatically. And in the case of not async, we're going to do the exact same thing, but we're going to call update navmesh data, which just doesn't have the async word at the end and does the exact same thing. And that's all we need to do in this script. If we come back to the Unity editor, I'll select the world geometry game object and attach the area floor baker script. I'll drag the navmesh surface that's on this game object already, drag the player, and I'm going to leave all the other variables alone because I set them how I wanted them to be. I'll again drag the scene view to the right and have the game view on the left. And I'll zoom all the way out on the scene view so we can see really how large this level is. And then I'll click play. It actually takes a minute to get started because this is a very large level. Once it does actually start playing, you can see that there's a very small section of this level that's actually baked with a nav mesh. And as I start moving around, you'll see the little blue highlighted nav mesh area move around with my player. This is really cool because we've now limited our baking size to be the size that we defined on the area floor baker, which is a 20 by 20 cube. As I move around, we can see that it does correctly consider the nav mesh modifiers because none of these allow me to walk on top of them. And if I change the size at runtime actually of the nav mesh size to 40 by 40, we can see that there's a larger section of floor baked and as soon as I start moving, it updates to be the larger size. I hope you got a lot of value out of today's video and you understand how to bake a nav mesh around a player within some bounds, not on the entire world geometry. I hope you also understand the difference between this and what we did last week and the different use cases that they apply to. If you have been getting value out of this video, please consider liking, subscribing to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. If you have any questions, if you have a suggestion for a topic, or if you're implementing AI into your game, drop a comment down below and I'll see you on the next video.